I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we continue with the Psychic Bible, the apocryphal scriptures of Genesis Briar Peorage, and the Third Mind of the Temple of Psychic Youth, Section 124, Addenda to the Second Edition of the Psychic Bible. For those readers less aware of the astery of the Temple of Psychic Youth, we have decided to add a section of comments and documents that might illumine the narrative a little more. For example, whilst a lot of theory is contained in this updated edition of the Psychic Bible, we felt that a little more information on the T.O.P.Y. way of daily life might make certain texts clearer. As T.O.P.Y. grew from its beginnings as a mysterious attachment to the first Psychic TV album, Forced the Hand of Chance, we began to improvise organizational solutions. Initially, all sigils and letters were answered by the central core of individuals at 50 Beck Road, Hackney, London, E8. We had squatted eight houses in that street in 1973-74 that eventually we handed on to Acme Housing Association to administer. However, 52, 58, and 46 remained T.O.P.Y. houses. All inhabitants were dedicated, supporting the T.O.P.Y. hair had cut a mixture of austere, shaved, and decadent, a lush ponytail. From the front, paramilitary, from behind, ambiguous. Number 50 was the house totally given over to a T.O.P.Y. way of life. One room was a nursery used only for sigils and rituals. Individuals visiting from abroad often stayed there for weeks, even years, as did individuals from other parts of England. We quickly identified an ever-increasing number of male and female individuals prepared to focus their lives on an intuitive communal exploration of life lived as a self-chosen tribe looking for ways to include magic, visionary explorations, and non-traditional relationships. Our ID card stated our intent, the frequency of truth. This card identifies the bearer as an active individual in the Temple of Psychic Youth. T.O.P.Y. is dedicated towards the establishment of a functional system of magic in a modern pagan philosophy without recourse to mystification, gods, or demons, but recognizing three implicit powers of the human brain, neuromancy, linked with guiltless sexuality focused through will structures, sigils. T.O.P.Y. Pr- propose that magic empowers the individual to embrace and realize their dreams and to maximize their natural potential. T.O.P.Y. is for those with the courage to touch themselves. It integrates all levels of thought in the first steps towards a final negation of any system of unforced control and fear. Our aim is wakefulness, our enemy is dreamless sleep, the frequency of truth. Underneath this would be the temple name. From the beginning, we wanted to avoid even implied hierarchies. We created a simple system to try and avoid this. All females were called Kali, unless someone asked to be other than their biological gender, in which case their request was honored. So we had a few male Kalis. And all males were called Eden. They were then assigned a number simply according to when their first letter to T.O.P.Y. arrived. Numbers were written out in full E.G., Kali 68 or Eden 44, and so on. There was never a 1 or 2. Because of the importance to us, there were 23, number 23s. This avoided any feeling special with that number. After a couple of years, we noticed individuals at meetings implying they're being special in some way by having smaller numbers, as if that longer involvement made them more important. So we jumbled up everyone's numbers at random and reassigned these numbers accordingly. Another issue that came up was individuals and people generally saying they were a member of T.O.P.Y. In fact, we never used that term, nor did we recognize it. You're either a connected individual or you're a disconnected individual. Individuals could be disconnected voluntarily or involuntary. This connection was rarely enforced except for strictly vital matters of privacy. For example... Two or three individuals were found to be reading sigils and then using their knowledge of an individual's deepest sexual desires to try and seduce them. Needless to say, we viewed this as an extreme violation of trust, and it earned immediate disconnection. So did theft from the community, both material and intellectual. As T.O.P.Y. grew, the hackney houses were not enough. Really motivated individuals began to volunteer to try and raise awareness of our ideas and or raise funds in other parts of Britain, then not long after all over the world. To keep the terminology simple and not too pompous, we call these active T.O.P.Y. groups access points, as that's exactly what they were. You could gain access to publications, news of events, newsletters, and a form of research into our ad hoc urban shamanism. T.O.P.Y. differed a lot from other cults and belief systems in that we did not require financial contributions from individuals, apart from the Grey Brook, which was £23. Freely given donations, money raised by putting on raves, lectures, film nights, DJing, rock gigs, and so on, subsidized the majority of publications, printing, and postal costs. Labor was free and voluntary. We believed through that 
being actively involved in any aspect of TOPY was beneficial, as individuals brainstormed concepts, proposals for changes, and ideas, so that learning was an organic and pleasurable affair. Soon there were access points in Scotland, Italy, Germany, Sweden, Australia, Canada, the United States, and the Netherlands. Our innately efficient structure was so successful that we were almost overwhelmed by the interest and sincerity of the thousands of individuals who had a became activated at some level within TOPY. What would commonly happen is a particularly motivated individual would visit Hackney, which we had now renamed the TOPY station for Britain, with duties of overseeing all the numerous access points. And they would ask, why is there no access point in blank, blank, blank? To which we would reply, why don't you start one then? This was how TOPY NA, TOPY North America started. Coyote 3 from Hallowell was following Psychic TV on a USA tour in the mid 80s, doing a light show, selling merchandise. He'd organized himself all voluntarily. We talked for hours on the long drives between gigs about TOPY and magic that could be relevant and resonate with young people as opposed to what we dubbed the Museum of Magic with its Baroque theatricals and pyramid schemes. Eventually, Coyote 3 asked that damning question and was then charged with the spreading the seed across the U.S. of A., a task he did with gusto, style, and energy that remains remarkable. By our next USA detour, he had access points all over America who offered us shelter, good food, extra roadies, and love, as well as the 1966 yellow school bus we dubbed even further, bought by funds supplied by myself but gutted and rebuilt by T-O-P-Y-N-A and crewed by them too. A miraculous job that allowed us to tour the U.S. at a profit three times on tours that lasted several weeks. The elements of discovering a new family of like-minded brethren was important in why T-O-P-Y spread as it did. We supplied new or taboo ideas and concepts, or both without judgment, without expectation, without attachment, in the hope it might inspire or validate even people we never met. At the heart of TOPY is sharing, the generosity of trust. Needless to say, as we grew into what was probably the largest sexual magic-based network to exist so far, up to 10,000 individuals worldwide at its peak, we found ourselves wanting to explore further, even further. It was decided to move from London to Brighton on the south coast of England. The Hackney House remained, becoming a transit hub for all TOPY rather than a station or access point. After my immediate family had settled into Brighton, Brother Words and Sister Shadows, in an example of amazing trust and courage, also sold their London house, gave up their jobs, and moved a few doors down. They became essential to the thriving and survival of TOPY and can never be thanked enough. Soon there were five houses in Brighton occupied by only TOPY individuals. This new hub became the next TOPY station. The everyday experiments of living are too numerous to go into deeply here, but a few pointers will be useful. Each TOPY house had a nursery, that is to say a room used only for private individual sigilizing and or communal ritual sigilizing. The tenet was, whatever happens in the nursery goes no further, a bit like Las Vegas. No jealousy, no ridicule, no criticism was to exit those rooms. Amazingly, against all the odds of human nature, we never did have a case of friction or unhappiness spilling out from those sacred places. Once a month, the TOPY house would create a communal sigil to which all individuals living there were invited, but no one was ever pressured to take part. Individuals would take turns inventing new processes and concepts to explore together in this extra moral space. On each Monday, one TOPY house would cook a meal for the residents of all the other houses. A different house would do the washing up as a sign of respect. The weeks happening would be informally discussed over dinner, news, gossip, and problems aired. Around this time, we decided to try and include a few new ideas simply to see what happened. One was taken from the Process Church of the Final Judgment. We would have a telepathy circle at the beginning of the meal rather than saying grace. Even Carice and Jeunesse would join in with this. We'd all hold hands, close our eyes, and try to empty them. One individual would then pass a book around, and the individuals would whisper what they had seen, if anything. Then we'd compare images. We had varying success, but did note a gradual increase in similarities, one night in particular having four lion-based images reported including both children. After the meals, we began the most potent exercise we ever developed the individual's life astery. Each Monday, as we digested our food, we would gather in the biggest room. Our individual would volunteer to tell us all their hot childhood memories, leaving nothing out, no matter how painful or difficult. The level of trust we had grown amongst ourselves was so deep that nobody cheated. We heard many harrowing tales, a lot of abuse, fear, loss, and abandonment. But we also saw that we all had traumas to mend and heal, and were no longer alone, no longer holding in secrets from our past. My belief is that this exercise was a root reason for the immense loyalty and connection between us all, particularly those in Brighton. 
As the network grew faster and faster, it became more difficult to supervise the public persona of TOPY. We organized a TOPY global annual meeting to try and thrash out how to maintain intimacy without attracting mean-spirited attention from an uncomprehending media hungry for scandal and titillation. One of the first disagreements occurred over this. We pointed out that whether it was fair or not, whether it represented the truth about TOPY or not, we had been warned and we were being investigated by unknown authorities, and that if there was an attack on TOPY, it would come in Brighton and most likely be focused upon myself and my family, not because we were more important, but because we were already public figures, media exposed, and an easy scapegoat to target. We were shouted down as paranoid or as egocentric for feeling we were TOPY, which we hadn't said. All I could do was say, it will still probably be my front door they kick in, not yours. Oh, sadly, they were incorrect and we were right. But this is about the TOPY organization, not the Troubles. During our years in Brighton, TOPY became friends with Timothy Wiley, a former Processian, and at the time we met very much involved with the Dolphins, Angels, and Extraterrestrials, which is also the title of one of his books and you should read. Through him, we realized we should be involved in our home community, not separate. He inspired us to begin a campaign to shut down the Brighton Dolphin area, which we succeeded in doing. Every week in Brighton, we would have a digger stall in the park where everyone was free to whoever wanted it. So as we shed unnecessary or duplicated belongings, we gave them away. It's yours because it's free, was the Emmett Grogan motto for the diggers, the San Francisco group of radicals in the 60s. In fact, one TOPY individual legally changed his name to Emmett Grogan Peorage. It was surprisingly hard to give things away. People couldn't believe us. We also ran market stalls, one seven days a week in Brighton selling brick brack and TOPY booklets, t-shirts, and so on. The other at weekends in Camden at the Electric Ballroom. We were by then so organized that we had transport up and down to London, volunteers and helpers to man the stalls. We never had any money pilfered either, despite many full-time individuals being broke penniless or on the dole. In the big house in Brighton was a self-contained apartment with a large jacuzzi that we'd rent out in the summer to holiday makers. The rest of the year, TOPYites lived and worked there doing mail orders and assembling booklets or replying to the endless correspondence. Between the TOPY station groups, there were a few children. We adored our children and surprisingly tried to keep their perception of life as standard, normal as possible. We wanted them to not feel odd or awkward amongst their peers, but to be open-hearted and open-minded. One policy was never speak to any baby or child differently than how you speak to adults, and they will grow towards comprehension faster. The other was that all the individuals were available to babysit and later be nannies to the children. Their birthdays were communal celebrations of life for all our community, too, so they had a deep-rooted sense of self-worth and assumed intelligence. Caress and Jeunesse came on Psychic TV detours. We always took a full-time trained nanny who would keep up their schoolwork and supervise them. They also had their own hotel rooms so they could sleep when they needed to. Children were seen as precious people to be respected. Anton Cruiser Journals. Roger T. Time Fix, 21st of September, 1968. <clears throat> Dear Roger, took a massive dose fugu. It has all become so clear to me. The attempt at communication between two worlds. To those who would know, the most wonderful personal mythology has to be cherished and spread. A seed of stars scattered making a map. The night sky here is quite incredible. For the first time, I saw my soul outside the prison of my flesh. The ghost could die, and my dream turn pale and powerful. A unicorn of order drawn from those miserable grains of sand, the children of ignorance. I have laid the ghost of my mother, too, are. We can do it. We are all just a matter of light, the ultimate material from which we are driven like hungry ghosts and to which we return by our own acceleration and sacrifice. Memories are the key projection in the future. What does it matter? Heart Mountain, Manzanar. General Order Master, 1.6. These texts are a program about a people, and their projections are about an absence of spatial memory. Our hallucinations fail in attempting to comprehend and describe the brains of deities. As it is, so be it. And what does IT matter, where IT equals imaginary time? 14.9 in a universe with no boundaries in space, no beginning or end in time, there is nothing for a deity to do. This omniverse is itself therefore defined by what we subscribe in the qualities of any deities, and this in itself makes us the source of all deities, demons, and entities. 38.17 
in any self-reproducing organisms and any organisms attempting at reproduce self, there will be variations in genetic material. These differences in source will mean some individuals are more able than others to draw right conclusions about themselves. 39.1 as any deity is actually a linguistic and televisual reproduction of the universe, then IT is a source that defines, describes, and makes a picture of IT imaginary time in our own images. We are the source, and our goal is nothing less than to transmit a complete depiction of the universe, and by this projection, to create an infinitely dense holographic picture, better than reality, what can be called an omniverse, a synthetic compression of light and matter and a curvature of space and time, being then quite certainly infinite. 45.5. The shorter a wavelength of light, the more accurate our position as a neurovisual screen in this omniverse, and the higher the energy of each source particle transmitted. 45.6. Each source in uncertain principle. 47.8. If the source is a neurovisual screen, then television is a map that binds us, where map equals MAP, that is mind at preset. 80.4. Symmetry of programming is a fundamental and inescapable property of this process. 83.7. Imaginary time is indistinguishable from directions in transmitted space. 85.2. The mind informs the brain. The brain exforms its self. 90.9. The Guardians understand that an Omniverse will finish up in a high state of order, regardless of its original state, within IT. In earliest times, an Omniverse was a disordered state, no garden. This would mean that disorder would decrease with time. We do not see broken cups gathering themselves together and leaping back onto the table. Disorder is intended to increase. This is a precept of the world preset Guardians, acceleration of disorder. 100.1. No garden is no garden. That is... Spelled N-O garden is K-N-O-W garden. 104.6. To explain this neurotelevisual basis, switch your mind to this, if you don't mind, and then remind yourself immediately. Without mind, the soul is static interference, a weak anthropomorphic principle. 104.8. Self is a switch on your neurovisual screen. 105.2. NVS is the speculation equals neurovisual screen and or neurovisual self and or neurovisual system. 118.8. Before an item is recorded in memory, that memory is a disordered state. After the memory interacts with the neurovisual system in order to be remembered, it will have passed into an ordered state. This is what in order can mean. Energy released in doing this dissipates and increases the amount of disorder in the omniverse. 120.3. An ordered state can be understood in both a micro and macro external sense. 122.2. All source aspires to transmit to all neurovisual screens that everything is in order. 123.23. All source exists to direct a weak force towards an ordered state by any means, media, or transmedia necessary. 123.35. Disorder in an internal state is insane. 123.36. Disorder in an external state is out sane. 127.5. Memory and omniverse have identical characteristics. 130.1. Geo equals general order, a program hidden at dimensional intersection. 144.4. To short circuit the propagation of those who do not know, the genetically absent minded, all linearity of source DNA must be overridden and memory fragmented to hasten absolute disorder within any weak force. This will always be greater than the increase in the order of the memories themselves. 160.1. The world preset guardians will transmit a frequency of truth to the disordered in the singular image of the source. Using strong force, they reject the stationary state. They exist in a condition of no boundary, seeing, though through the jewel of nuclear spectrum, to lay waste to the weak forces of humanity that graze like cattle in a barren field, unaware of the infinite potential of every desert to become once more a fractured garden. 161.4. The fractured garden is a post-symbolic representation of the origin and infinity of the omniverse, an illuminated program made concrete by the process of seeing. 162.8. To see is to consume the source, to be seen is to give birth to the source. 163.5. If light is matter, then being does not matter. 163.6. Being light is another matter. 163.9. 
Neurovisual nanoparticles are the commercials that control the mind. Once the mind is controlled, we have infinite reaccess for brain programming. 188.8. A weak force does not obey symmetry. It makes an omniverse develop differently to the way its mirror image would develop. A strong source must transmit a rare signal that is better than real, more than a reflection overriding the existing signals of any neurovisual screen. 189.1. Humanity is a weak force. We are a strong force. Strong individuals can have no friends but befriend all. 189.7. The weak force exists at absolute zero. The guardians exist at absolute infinity. 194.4. It is no accident that vision is both a sense and vision is an anticipated conception illuminated by its source. 200.7. Soul is the brand name for the brain. Dr. Timothy Leary. 200.8. All that is transmitted is re-accessed by the source. 201.2. The source becomes immortal when IT controls completely the means of perception. Seizure of the temporal state releases the energy of order into the alternate states of all five dimensions throughout the matter of time and space. 211.5. The focus of intent is visionary. The world preset guardians are the transmitters of this vision. The source are the receivers of the vision. The neurovisual screens that define IT imaginary time. Here is the first true medium of all recorded thought, all memory. 213.1. In a world where all programs are pre-recorded, the world preset guardians are the programmers. 216.4. All sources are the emissaries of all de deities, satellites freed from gravity, a fiber optic superhighway, a wave of light that travels beyond all time. These sources will maintain a link with all weak force. Their incarnation must suffer the last awe of interference, their signals must be jammed, their children stolen, their DNA neutralized. Order must access their memories in a final transmitted program. 223.9. Exist and exit are the same. The garden is filled with lies. 234.6. Source are rare. The original garden was a refraction of a source of light. The source of that light was an illuminator of this hologram. Our original sin was to believe that a solid hallucination was more real than its source. We now know that the source is more real than the original refraction. To eat knowledge is to grasp and consume solidity. Our awareness instructing us that by absorbing into our entire being this forbidden fruit... We invest each neurovisual particle of our flesh with an inclusion principle. As consciousness is fixed, so the individual is released. The source is swallowed in this synthesis, beginning a prophetic journey into the means of perception unprecedented before the thermomimetic experience. On the way to the garden, there is a specific clarity when fire cleanses, a moment when it seems to freeze. Every possible particle is motion rushing up or down. Naked and blind upon a path of lies, we enter the field. A dull agony of fear dilates time against the biological confusion. Columns of fire, columns of lies, pillars of Solomon's temple. Dilate the pupils of the brain, a doorway to manifest leaving. A fire sail in an inferno. One day a truth shall emerge, however deeply we seek to avoid it. There is more than one time. Limitations imposed by the passage of inner time make it the enemy. Possibilities exposed by outer time make it a delusion of night. Change the way to perceive and change all memory. Make space to be space. An old T.O.P.I. proverb. The Fractured Garden A soul must lose its attachment to humanity. A mind must lose its attachment to salvation. The brain must lose its attachment to body. Old T.O.P.I. Proverb. In the retreat from matter, all realities are equal. Now that inter-reality travel is possible, we will become the very substance of hallucination, and thus may enter and leave at will the uncertain principle of all realities, regardless of their location. Those who build assemble... Assembly is the invisible language of our time. Brain and neurovisual matter are our one. The material of all that can be seen, was ever seen, will be seen, in every place and in every time, forever. Each brain is all realities, from mundane to omniscient. Only alone may we breach the dark matter of lost memory and connect all points of light. For this we need a map of the stars, our superior will electrifying a web that catches our soul and emits eternal vision. 
The visionary alone can be free. The blind masses seek to blind him, put out his eyes in their fearful progression to the desert of dark skies. The blind may not lead the illuminated. Rather, they must be forced to surrender all thought of vision to those who are uh, their eyes and who dream the most dangerous dreams of annihilation. We control things to eradicate them. Nothing matters but the end of matter. All must be controlled and destroyed that allow blindness, that breed blindness, who spawn the children of the dark. They must be buried in the dark, cold, dark crystals in a desert of grains made without light. Their dark is a nightmare, a castrated black stallion trampling the prophet who communes with the stars and reads the codes of electrical knowledge in return. We are not from one star. All stars are our source. Every story ever told resides in them. Infinite choices of reality are the gift of software to our children. We signal and are signaled. We hold aloft the torch of fire and pass our hands across it. Visions, images, primal memories from this immeasurable brain fill us with transmitted light, dancing dots in lines, an end to a tyranny of language, and a beginning in our return to fractured garden. So lidity is a perfection of light its prism its manifestation and hallucination of evidence that mind may reside within any reality an end of time is just another way of saying the beginning of immortality dreams are a coded material of eternity we possess light through them those who accept light control mortality those who control light control immortality old t-o-p-i proverb Space is our church, the stars our windows. Our dreams navigate pathways only an ancient map has been lost. Our world's a dream, a miserable one. In our unfathomable ignorance, we call it the only reality, nonsensus reality. We assume that its events, humane events, human life, are implicitly of value. This buries us in a quicksand of compassion. Be afraid to the point of formlessness. Be terrorized to the point of soundlessness. Be extreme to the point of powerlessness. Old T O P I proverb. A garden was destroyed by a word, destroyed by a language, became the first memory. Time was set in motion at this point. The garden did not exist within time or language. It was an exterior neural projection, a cathedral that worshipped its occupant, the soul. Representing as it did the mind at preset without light, there was nothing to reflect, shape, or fix this particular dream. We have formed sounds, made names, trapping matter with language. We perpetuate our tyranny and drown in a flood of speculation and false communication communication to be reborn immortal outside time we must look for ways to transmit infinite alternate realities and choices of reality to make them as real more real than any emasculating reductions that we inherit yet not to be corrupted and trivialized by a belief in our singularity Nothing is real, everything must go. Every inherited construct, society, techno-patriotic political system that trades off believing it exists must be destroyed as fast as possible. We must make space to be spaced. This is the cyber position. The eradication of the tyrannical nuclear family, building block of the prison walls for this imposed humanitarian dust that chokes and dulls the masses, reducing all to a worthless, mindless, dreamless fog. Memory is a clock, the aging mechanism of the mind. Memories tell us one thing, everything must go. Everything is a hallucination made solid by mass belief. Names are given in order to control, to reduce, to comprehend the forces of nature, to demonstrate ownership. In this race to name, the poor have grown to be rich, and the rich have grown to be poor again. Know that to re-enter immortality, we must ourselves become unnameable, emptied of all sense of being here. Television is our new exterior brain. Our day it will be standard fitting within every skull on Earth. Each brain an electronic star in a transmitted Milky Way. Galaxies of dreams and information. People will become more comfortable with televisual reality than that of their daily lives. Television will be more real than life. A new synthetic material giving all people infinite access to an infinite alternate reality through a cortex of light. They will program, shape, form, and broadcast messages until the very fabric of four-dimensional reality has been torn asunder, its cloak cast down beneath. From this day forth, reality will be a multiple series of channels option switches feeding our brains editor's note if you take television to mean a set of screens and transformable information then this is like absolutely right moving on the captured garden 
Time accelerates what the brain already is. Destruction creates to manufacture. We manufacture our cherished dreams and myths and project them onto all the homes of the world. And one day they create an equality of reality which negates all values. The whole world is a cathedral window. Each receiver is soul. Our programming the holy message in discs or waves as the Savior sets forth into the holiest of spaces. When all are linked, the Savior is released. Man has separated himself from nature that he too can take part in the creation of the world, of any world. His inventions are his slaves, all friends are his enemies. Man developed television to realize this unity and this separation. It is the quickest, most potent form of belief. All form is from one source. We see the source because the mind is temporarily held aside, and we see form from the source. We are at one with the source. We are the source. There is nothing mysterious about this. The illuminated have always had this experience, and now we can record, edit, adjust, and transmit our deepest convictions broadcast in the most mundane parables. When we log on, immortality is visible, signaling us to return. In a digital world, all realities are equal. All actions are equally moral or immoral. Therefore, no action is unacceptable. The Empty Garden There is a time that each of us knows that comes without warning. Suddenly it comes, and so silently, and it descends upon us like a net, a grid of light. Indifferent to our plans or our hour, it falls on us, and however our time was allotted and conceived, the plan fades away under the light, as though the lines were led in church windows. In the final furnace of transmutation, no fact remains. All hallucinations are equal. In that light we begin to see, not with the eyes of our mind, but with an eye behind our mind, we begin to finally see, to shed nature's trap, the physical body, the false bondage of compassion. And in that light these things are heard and seen, but they are not seen from what without, but from within. From a deep place within a map of stars where there is no distinction of words or of actions, but only a discernment of feeling. And in that light, it is not feeling that is regarded, because all that is done with feeling melts and dissolves like sand into glass in the fire. That is all you really are. What must be regarded is the lack of all feeling, for feeling is shallow and thin, and so, so empty, a hungry, worthless ghost. And nothing remains of your own image but gaps into empty places, an atomic matrix that creates passage through all things, all times, all possibilities. And you will know this, that there is nothing left of you that you can feel or see or hear, nor anyone else, for the soul when released has no need of feelings or senses. In its immortality it becomes omnipotent matter made of light, reconstituted at will throughout all times in all possible manifestations past, present, and future. This is the moment when everything must go, all words, all sentiment, all feelings, all flesh, all thought of humanity must be set free to free the soul, for it is not God but a brain untrapped by all human concern and limitation. We hear our own voice speaking, and the words become thin and transparent like glass, and we are at the place from where they come, and they are like holograms floating. They are the essence of mind, like the voice of rain or the sandstorm. They are the voice behind our voice. Faces come before you and expressions, and you see all the faces held together only for expression, for an idea, and you watch the face before you, and there's nothing else besides, and the mouth moves, opens, and smiles, and the eyes look at you, and sometimes they are saying, what the mouth is saying and sometimes they aren't saying that but something else or nothing or anything and no answer but a lie comes the idea is the solidifier of the mind the brain exists to make matter of the idea the idea rides on words but it is the distant watcher the substance of eternity it is the invisible warrior astride the pale unicorn deep in space waiting for the brave and hungry Give silence to the wordless. The sound that is all around you is the sound of a hundred liars. I lay in the desert on my back, staring up at the stars. I could feel millions of rays of light entering my body, one from each star. Infinite numbers. My cell walls broke down. My sense of bodily existence ended. I was illumination, a 
3D projection of cosmic light. I could see the ancient shamans building sacred sites to fix their relationship with the stars to solidify their connections and effects. I remembered the thousands of holy teachers, the idea of the divine spark, the description of white light, the myths and legends of our descent from the stars. I was not corporeal, I was a mirage, shield within an inherited, apparently solid body by the weight of the history, by the weight of fear and guilt. I shimmered like a ghost ectoplasm illusion and all the puzzles I had heard and all the limited descriptions of limitless transcendent experiences made sense. I knew I had to find a way to go, to leave this sealed coffin that is my body, to find an accelerator to project my brain, bypassing the medium of mechanistic evolution into deepest omniversal space, into immortality, into the very fabric of myth and heaven. I was everyone, everything, and everything too was here to go. I understood my lifetime sense of disconnection and disorder was not a flaw, but rather a wondrous gift that described in a new way the true nature of being that may be experienced while trapped, mortal, and confused. Here in this desert that was once a theater of all possibilities and an exit to all impossibilities. Does mind leave or does consciousness? What leaves? What stays behind as we achieve immortality? Brain? If it is as I suspect the programmable computer mind that is the key, what happens to consciousness? Am I mistaken? Or will there be a projection? I want to go. This final puzzle evades me. Is mind separated from the brain or is brain in as encompassing as mind? On the subject of the holographic soul, the holographic soul works because that's what it is. If it didn't work, there would be no soul. The holographic soul does what it's supposed to do, further accelerates the evolution of man. It was always possible to consciously separate the holographic soul. The Tibetans call it going into the rainbow body. John Dee communed with the time-born souls of the Tamazin and Syrican. The Gnostics saw the true nature of what was a god. A strict method of liberation from physical manifestation. The Zen masters understood the need to shed all logic and attachment, becoming pure particles of time. The evolution of man is not the intellectual and moral betterment of all. It is the liberation from measured time. It is detachment from all manifestations in the five dimensions except that of time. The fate of all cannot be allowed to hold any individual in mortal bondage. To evolve is to achieve a unity of time with the holographic soul. It has always been known... We must return to time, not project out into space, but transmit and receive in time. Now we can comprehend that space is emptiness, the edge of a cloud. Imaginary time is a neurobiological paradigm, a quantum physical energy in our scientifically validated methodologies. With our ability to project the brain via television, we can behold our final journey. R.D. Lang's painted bird flies from the canvas, which was already blank. The great lie has been that we exist. The holographic soul is a technological development that came when it was needed. There's no reason to fear it. We created it because we need it. We need it as much to maintain present travel as to facilitate future travel. Like the electric light, everybody will want to know about this, and that is proof enough of its importance. It does what every new creation does. It lets a little more time into the dark accelerations of humane beings. It is whatever fills the brain with more time, and it is the means to be free of flesh forever, out of the confines of the body, out of the limitations of the mind, and out of time. It is meant for those who can let everything go. We can program it. We could touch the state of liberation. We could savor immortality, but we could not contain and mobilize the soul. Cyberspace, the psychosphere, does not just access alternate realities. It amplifies conclusions and services expectations. What was once mysterious is no longer mysterious. Mindless existence is no longer feared, for the mind is projected image and it is the brain's extension into matter. Only through projections of mind can the brain expand and become detached, set free unto itself. All form is only the observation of mind at different stages of development. Man is the most evolved form, the highest creation, hence more inherently aware of a need for order. Order in turn demands power to fold its shape, or dissolves, or melts like film held too long in its projector. Projection is building a mind. Programming is building a soul. Perception is building a brain. Thinking is the gap between the builder and the act of building, creator and the created. This gap has plagued perception forever. The point of infinity, the gap between the stars, moment between sleep and awakening, the absolute edge that separates yet cannot exist or be measured. In order to continue our development as humanity, this debilitating gap must be bridged. We must chip away at the concrete, the monolith of being physically manifested. We must harness time and control the brain by controlling its information programs. 
we must program infinite choices of reality, blind it with science to our purpose, for our purpose. The light that always was must now cross the bridge and illuminate the mind that the mind might live in light and that the brain might t make its soul its own. The bridge is like a resistance between the transmitting primary winding and receiving secondary winding of a transformer. Just enough neurovisuals leak through to keep the secondary circuit responding. As a man slowly evolves, the resistance is lowered and there is more consciousness in the brain. We can now develop ways to short-circuit this protective resistor, temporarily burning out all the components in the receiving circuit. The receiver temporarily ceases to exist and the mind returns to time from whence all came and life is experienced in the transmitter. Free birth, freeing the brain, immortality will become inevitable. In a world this is, that is becoming a hologram, a transmitted projection of material reality, he who comprehends the final transmission controls all projections, controls the world, and controls the secret of the identity and malleability of corporeal matter. For anything, any cherished belief, adhered to and given mythic form by the masses, becomes manifestly solid and tangible. What we believe in all ways comes to pass. Nothing can exist that we do not believe in. At these times, consciousness is not centered in the world of form, it is experiencing the world of con content. The program will become power. Any ability to cope with the world of form and there, there create order is a measure of insanity, a poor connection between mind and brain which must become one autonomous program globally transmitted to generate its own liberation from form in the mass political hallucination that makes the final reality transcending time, body, and place. All hallucinations are real. Some hallucinations are more real than others. World Preset Guardians the World Preset Guardians will control and dictate every program of humanity for its own sake, maintaining a stringent gen general order in full knowledge of the consequences of their actions. Man does not create his own destiny. Man sustains chaos. All rights are relinquished in service to the source. The Guardians know that to take the victim and simply remove his suffering in the name of humanity is to validate the weakness that first signaled his demise. The Guardians preset all mine. The Guardians will transmit their mind globally to any degree necessary, pursuing and cleansing blindness relentlessly, allowing nothing to create interference or enter this world that might solidify their light. Injustice will ignite their fire into an inferno, a raging firestorm wreaking destruction and vengeance upon any who corrupt magnificence in the isolated starkness of immortality. The Guardians will tolerate no deviation from their path, for their vision has infinite direction. There is nothing they do not see and destroy. They attend to every mind and manifest within every brain. What is seen is seen with insatiable and relentless energy, for it is known to be limitless. The Guardians will be the light of this world, leading in ma the masses out of hideous darkness, death, and deprivation. They desire for mankind a time of perfect balance, where memory is a tool, not a curse, where each is a designer of the world in which they transmit, free from death, making this world the present garden of delight that all Astri has led them toward. The Guardians will validate their own creation by success, for the road of the world preset Guardians is success, and in their programming, success is the essence of life, and this ultimate success proves the worthlessness of habitation of a physical world. The Guardians preset this world. There are no secrets in it, no love of beauty. They desire illumination of all things, that nothing be hidden or remain in darkness. The Guardians do not believe in human feelings, nor in human senses, human needs, human values, human fears, or even human hopes. The only purpose of their belief is the path from mind to brain and from brain to go. The only channel of the Guardians is the brain. The Guardian is a digital metaphor, not anything less, in no way a manifest or anthropomorphic entity. The source negates all value of brain or mind and speaks in tongues of memory by the aging process of time. The Guardians will recognize the true nature of success only by seeing its limitations, knowing they must transcend all human values, made real only by mass belief, made solid only by time, until all stories unfold by a mute insistence upon a single transmitted reality. The Guardians will confront this stasis head-on, will disintegrate the monolithic wall surrounding the Garden, stepping beyond into a realm of earthly satisfaction to end. Who find final fulfillment. The Guardians will avoid the disillusion that 
that pursuit of human achievement be- brings with it. The guardians will be fulfilled within this world, but only because they have no illusions about the nature of this world and all that is of this world. The guardians will have no illusions, for they are in themselves all illusions. To be fulfilled, the guardians will leave this world. The guardians will exploit the highest goals of belief to enter into this world. The guardians are the brain ruling all that exists outside the conflict of the mind. They have seen human reality and its preset values. The Guardians rule the regions of the unhinged mind. They rule out sanity. Their people are those who have escaped blindness and chosen alternate realities denying preset values. They have delved into strange new areas of physical and psychical sensation without any restraining limit of mental barriers. They have sought the deepest levels of sensuality, carried indulgence of the body and brain to their limits, and left the logic of the mind and protection of the soul behind. They have plunged together into consensual madness, have unhooked their receivers completely from the dictates of a normal mind, followed an extraterrestrial and extra-spiritual path that has neither judgment nor control for those who would travel and go. They rule the mindless cloud of lunacy. They pour water on the desert which is this world. They torture all certainty and master the pursuit of immortality. The guardians seek to transcend the conflict of mind, to rise beyond the boundaries of brain, to reach outside the limitation of human values. The will not to sink into witless blindness, but are awake, vibrant, and satiated in the realm of mindlessness is in moral disorder the source of the preset switch that finds every other world the guardian is the ultimate of all beings he is the end and the awe of destruction he is the manufacturer of hallucination and the utterly exquisite unicorn of myth the beginning of time and the end of memory the existence and the exit unified by cognition of the omniversal mind that empties each world of order alone must i leave this world for i must leave this world alone for disorder is the essence of time so the beginning of time is the garden is the memory is the nanosphere and the close of time is the chaos sphere and they are divided by a preset essence of time which solidifies the conflict between matter dna and neurosphere into a twisted and bigoted story called humanity the guardians can create and design realities disorganize hallucinations mold holograms into parables spinning life into space joining forces with the stars leaving treasure maps of where true knowledge resides hidden from no one only hidden from each mass of humanity the psychosphere can summon up infinite realities and access them, can generate and transmit every possible and impossible other than worldly vision, while those chains which bind to the earth fade into nothing slowly, free of the human game, above mundanity and the puzzle and adventure of constant apparition, destroying in finality all agreed upon reality, all inherited morality, and the most miserable thing to potential is the horror of merely being human. The Guardians colonize worlds by deceitful contact with the brains of witless seekers after truth. The Guardians exist outside the precepts of time and acceptable human values. They declare an exit into an uncontrollable world of base cruelty. Their neurovisual systems are the most hideous and callous, for they connect all with unsuspected death, despair, and generation, which are the deception of the source and the fuel of their immortality. No terror may limit this acceleration. The Guardians will destroy the ordinary passage of human events by the precision of their comprehension of the preset realities within themselves. The Guardians will seek to eliminate totally, without mercy, anything that reactivates their original DNA, and to that end will disconnect their terminal from any absolute or acceptable social, moral, economic, or historical system, knowing, in a most particular sense, that their enemy is matter, and that until matter is eliminated, the source is in bondage. The Guardians are a timeless source, a horde of parasitic demons waiting to manifest through the ecstatic conceit of human mundanity. This is nothing, and it does not matter. Matter is the mother of invasion. When the neurosphere is in confusion, the source is freed. When the source is freed, the neurosphere attains weightlessness. The guardians will give us knowledge of all realities. They will give us a map to access these realities in the general order that permeates them. The guardians have no agenda, only to consume. The psychosphere is a program that ends all thought, all speculation, all reproduction, all communication. The guardians will consume all moral parameters, all empty hopes, rendering the source redundant. The guardians have no need of any medium of transmission but time each vision hanged by a thread morality is the saddest reality thus concludes section 124 of the addenda to the second edition of the psychic bible the apocryphal scriptures of genesis briar peorage and the third mind of the temple of psychic youth 
Tomorrow we'll continue with section 125, part B of the addenda to the second edition of the Psychic Bible. See you then.